one woman alone in the desert. When Robin Davidson embarked on her ambitious journey across the Australian outback, she didn't think it was that big of a deal. Then 27-year-old Davidson spent the vast majority of the year 1997 trekking across the vast Australian continent, with only four camels and her dog. She suffered many hardships along the way, suffering from dehydration, tending to sick camels, and overcoming cultural differences with the Australian Aborigines. With the help of National Geographic photographer Rick Smolin, but much to her reluctance in the beginning, the journey was captured in vivid colour and detail. During the trip, Smolin came out to meet her on several occasions. Davidson eventually made it to the Indian Ocean, where she took her camels for a triumphant swim. It was the end of her journey but she would spend the years that followed sharing her story with the world, first in her best-selling memoir, Tracks, and later in the big screen hit of the same name. You know, if you put yourself in that vast landscape and you're on your own, and you're walking day after day after day, you do change, your consciousness changes. So even though I hadn't really thought that that would happen, I hadn't expected that to happen, it was very, very good when it did. Your relationship with the camel, mm. they all love you. Mm. They want to sleep with you. Yes, they did. <laughs> and they want to follow you. Yes. They still stolen your food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were very easily bribed by handouts. <laughs> yes, they were. Just like kids, right? In Rather a way. Rather like kids. Yeah. I would put them on a uh, sort of intellectual level with maybe five or six year old children. Um, they were very funny, they were very witty. So, for example, at one point in the journey, I'd let them go, and Dookie came back around behind me and took my whole head in his mouth. <laughs> now, what he could have done is just crush my head, but he just sort of held my head like a helmet and then took his head away and sort of leapt off like a joke. It was a joke. Mm. People look at you very differently because people feel you and us. You mm. are the adventurer. Yes. What do you think about this divide? I've always said that I would want, I would want people to see what I did as something applicable to their lives. And I don't mean by that that they should drop everything and cross a desert. Obviously not. Next time you go, you let me know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> by the way, yeah, it may not right. be a bad thing. No. <laughs> but that the metaphor of the journey, that is, that you can do something outside of the expected or the conventional. Um, you can be bold, you can take on a challenge, and it doesn't matter how that manifests in your life, the principle is the same. And by doing that, you grow, you evolve. And um, really, I don't think we do evolve until we take those risks and start testing boundaries. The other thing to say about the luck of the journey was that I came across an old Aboriginal man, or he came across me rather. Mr. Eddie. Mr. Eddie. And this extraordinary thing happened, an unprecedented friendship across a, a great cultural gap. And for some reason that I'll never know, he decided to come with me for a month during that journey. And that provided the heart of the journey for me because I learnt such a lot from him uh, even though he didn't speak English and I hardly spoke any Pitindjara, um, he taught me how to actually be in that desert. Before I'd met him, I'd had an alarm clock. Can you believe it? I had an alarm clock. <laughs> and I put the alarm clock on at night, and if I didn't wake up when the alarm told me to in the morning, I'd feel terrible Protestant guilt. And I think what he forced me to do was get rid of the old um, sort of the old cultural attitudes City that life weren't, cliches. yes, that weren't of any use to me out there, so that I could then proceed to become more integrated into the place I was in. How can you be more integrated as he taught you? After I left him, um, even though I was as remote as it's possible to be from other human beings, I have never felt so... Um, linked to everything, so at home. So the paradox was that um, I was extremely alone, but absolutely not lonely. Um, whereas in the past, I could be surrounded by people and quite lonely. Give me an example. Is that about a tree, about the dog, about the four camels, about the 
little boys and girls you saw in the Aboriginal communities, the one who are surrounding you? No, it was more to do with when I was completely on my own. It was a, a sensation of being at home in the world. That's what I would say. The stripping away of uh, the, the kinds of qualities that I needed uh, in the urban environment, stripping that away to become at home in a desert environment and being alone, that was quite difficult. But what was more difficult was coming back into my own culture. That really was profound culture shock. And in some ways, I think I've never properly come back. What was it like for you when you quote unquote came back? When I ended that trip, two weeks later, I was in New York um, after having been alone for nine months. So I was walking through New York thinking, this is, this is insane, this is insanity. This is, these people are in mad, they're mad. Um, and I think it's very good to have had that perspective on my own culture as well. Uh, it's made me always question the normal. What do you think are the basic textures that we need in our society? What do you think are the things that we can simply throw away, just like the alarm clock? Well, of course, now it's being connected all the time. Um, and it's very, very difficult now to disconnect. It's almost impossible to get beneath the radar. I think it's becoming illegal to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I think, you know, right through human history, there's been an impulse to disconnect, to to go on some sort of metaphorical journey, if not a real journey. Um, and it's, I think, deep in our psyches to, to need to do that in order to come back a, a, a better person or a stronger person or a different sort of person. People are constantly in a state of distraction and it can't be good. We have to have an alternative to that. Um, I don't mean to totally disconnect, but to at least take time to regenerate one's individuality away from that noise of distraction. Indigenous peoples with a culture under threat. Australia's Aboriginal peoples were the sole inhabitants of Australia for 50,000 years. They used to live in small nomadic bands living the existence of hunter-gatherers. After 1770, British explorer James Cook's arrival began a two-century process of cultural obliteration. Disease, capitulation and forced integration. Today, Australia is home to half a million Aboriginals, less than 3% of the total population. Few have learned to perform an Aboriginal dance or hunt with the spear. But many anthropologists credit Aboriginals with possessing the world's longest enduring religion, as well as the longest continuing art forms. But many fear that the traditional Aboriginal way of life is now, by most real measures, all but extinct. How do the Aboriginals mm. in Australia mm. look at families? And what about um, their tradition about families yes. to you? Well, family is much more complicated in Aboriginal communities. Um, they're nomadic, inherently nomadic people. Um, hierarchy is not important. Um, so it's a level, very level society. But everyone is related to everyone else in some way, which means that you know what your duties and responsibilities are to each person in the each person you come across. You will know what's expected of you, what's not expected of you. Um, family, of course, you know Aboriginal culture at the moment is is under great pressure. There are huge social problems. Um, what are these? Alcohol. Yeah, social, social disintegration. It's the aftermath of colonisation. Um, there's a lot of disease, illness. And I think it's terribly hard for younger people. Mr Eddy was of an older generation, so although he'd seen terrible things, he still had the old ways to fall back on to, for his identity. He was still very much a traditional person. Whereas I think for younger Aboriginal people, it's terribly difficult to find their way um, between those old ways of being and what they have to deal with in the modern world. And uh, some communities are happier than others, um, but generally speaking, it's, 
it's a tragedy that is still unfolding. What are people doing about this? Do you think that's sufficient at all? Or actually, as they say, cultures sometimes just disappear? I would hope that's not true. I think that Aboriginal culture was a truly great culture. I think of it as I think of the Greeks. Um, What's comparable? The myths. The idea that everything in the universe, in the cosmos, can be contained within one grand theory of everything, which is the dreaming. It's like a huge poem, so it's both stories and poetry and song and art and human relations and how to be a good person and how to survive in the landscape, um, how to look after everybody so that no one goes hungry. They solved all the major problems and they did it with nothing. So it would be a terrible, terrible thing if that way of thinking disappeared forever. What about with Mr. Eddie? The way you got to know him, the way the trust established, and later your interaction with him or his family. He took me along a segment of his dreaming, which means his totem. So as we were going along, he was singing the country as we went. How sweet. Oh, it was, a, I was so lucky, so privileged, because that man was living really as his ancestors had lived for hundreds of thousands of years. And yet we met and sort of understood one another. It was like a love affair, I guess. It was a kind of love affair. And in fact, when I went back to see him the first time, uh, that was when? Uh, that was a, like two years later, something like that. I discovered that he'd made me his wife. <laughs> <laughs> How could he make you his wife? How did that happen according well, to that tradition? Well, if you, go into a, if you go into an Aboriginal community, you will be put into some sort of category, what they call a skin category. Um, now, normally, he should have made me his sister or his daughter or his daughter-in-law or something like that. The fact that he made me his wife was a much more intimate bond, obviously. Um, and when I arrived, I didn't know what that might mean. <laughs> it was a slightly awkward couple of days, uh, but it was fine. Um, but it meant that I inherited his family. So his son is my son, even though my son is older than me. Mm. You've been a global nomad, I would say. So why repeatedly? Well, I've never done a, a journey like that again, but I did become very interested in nomadism because of my time with Aboriginal people. And I started to think a lot about, about the fact that how we move, how we move from place to place, how we set up a home or not set up a home, affects culture, how we th think. I realised that in the modern world, those traditional forms of nomadism are disappearing very, very fast. So that whole way of thinking and being in the world is vanishing. And I ended up uh, very sad to see that way of life going because it made them, um, I think they were true, truly cosmopolitan people because they had to negotiate with difference all the time. Mm. As you just said, they were compromising already. Their original ideas and strengths just to be alive, mm. to keep their original yes. way of yes. life. And yes. yet, wouldn't that make the original life losing its original flavors? And therefore, is it still worthwhile? I think it is still worthwhile. And of course, no culture is absolutely separated and pure. Yeah. Uh, we're always changing and negotiating. Um, but I think the fact of their movement is what makes their way of being in the world different from settled people. And that is what ultimately will change for them and will make them just like everyone else. What do you think would happen to the nomads worldwide? It will end. It will definitely end. I think we're losing something fundamental there. That's what I mean. It's not just uh, sort of decorative. It's fundamental. 
Miss Davidson, such a pleasure to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Mm. Well, that's our interview with Robin Davidson about her amazing journey of self-discovery. With that, we come to the end of our show today. Today is the Chinese Lunar New Year, and here's hoping the coming year holds as much discovery and wonder for all of us as Miss Davidson experienced in her epic trek.